Uh, it's certainly a chilly day. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my flights are out, so I'm, uh, you, you folks are stuck with me for the next 24 hours. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I only have 10 minutes in the keynote. Um, what I want to talk about today was give you a perspective of, you know, how as, you know, as Harton works and as the, as the sort of the overall Hadoop community and the Spark community, we move forward. We are seeing increasing adoption of the cloud. Obviously, you know, the future is definitely cloudy, if not sunny, if not snowy, right? Um, we also have increasingly uh, people are building applications, uh, you know, which span the data center and the cloud, right? And the reason to that is pretty simple. You know, data is data. It's born, you know, wherever it's born, it's, you know, a lot of data is increasingly born in the cloud. It's increasingly born in the, you know, the sensors and so on. In a lot of places, it's actually much more cost effective to actually aggregate sensor data in the cloud rather than try to bring everything back on prem. On the other hand, you also have, you know, your traditional data sources um, and, and sort of, you know, uh, others, other data sources that the enterprises are not yet comfortable putting in the cloud. And what we're starting to see is, you know, sort of this notion of a data application which spans both the cloud and the data center, right? So if you took, look, like I said, if you, took, if you look at the connected car, the connected city, um, you know, we, we have a great relation with our friends Microsoft. Uh, we run HD Insight, uh, which is powered by Hortonworks. Now, they've been doing a lot of work, for example, in Barcelona. Um, the entire city is getting connected up u using Azure, and that's, you know, sort of the connected city work. Uh, we certainly work with a lot of auto manufacturers, uh, both in the United States and in, uh, especially in Europe. Um, the connected car is a real thing at this point. We have, especially with things like um, self-driving and auto, auto steering and so on coming in, there's a big need for, you to, for us to ingest literally terabytes, um, terabytes of data per hour per car and then do the analytics on it, even as you build out the models for, you know, which help, help the cars actually drive themselves. Right? Similarly, you, you want to take that data and bring, bring it into and, and join it to some of the manufacturing data that you have and you know, to do things like predictive maintenance. So you can actually in real time figure out what data is coming out of the car, what data you got from the factory, and join it and say, do I need, and also the location data and say, is, is this car near a, um, a, 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 a maintenance shop so we can actually bring it in based on the data we have, right? So let me give you some real-world examples of how we see this happening um, at Hortonworks when we uh, run with customers. Um, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, Prescient is a, is, a, is, a, is a sort of a mobile app. They have a, a very, very uh, premium product called Prescient Traveler. The idea of this, tra this Traveler application is that as you, take, as, as you travel you know, in, in foreign locations and so on, um, you want to be able to get real-time threat detection data. And I don't mean just from a sense of you know, uh, weather and so on. This is about if you go to this specific district in Paris, for, for example, is there some whatever local agitation or a strike or whatever that's happening which might impact your safety, right? So as you can imagine, this is a very, very um, sort of a premium but also a very, very sort of a real-time product. And, and if you look behind the scenes of what hap what's happening in Prussian, it's actually really, really interesting, right? So th these guys have literally 50,000, almost 50,000 sources of data, everything from you know, social media data to RSS feeds to geolocation, on and on and on. And they have to sort of, and they use Spark to actually bring this together up in, so, and build predictive models, right? Now, to actually bring the data from the, from the you know, devices and the sensors, they use another open source technology uh, called Apache and iFi. And iFi allows you to actually aggregate this data in a secure fashion with end-to-end -end sort of encryption, right? All the way down from the actual device. NiFi guys, uh, the NiFi community added something called a Minify, which is basically a really, really small driver you can actually throw on a, a, on a smartphone, for example, right? So that's a, a really, really interesting example of you know, how people are bringing data from the real world, also joining it with data they have you know, in, their, in, their, in their own data centers. Um, something closer to home, um, Symantec, you guys are all familiar. They have, they try, they, the, the whole idea of Symantec is they want to do real-time threat detection. Uh, they have, like I said, um, literally 75 million plus devices, and they have to get that data um, on, their, on their sort of cloud platform. They initially started doing on-prem, but in, interestingly, they've actually moved completely to, uh, to the cloud and AWS right now. Uh, the really interesting part here is how fast they can build the models. You know, 
literally, even two years ago, they were doing, they needed about three to four hours to actually build a model and deploy it. But right now, it's actually gone to you know, anywhere between one and two seconds with sort of real-time um, streaming and, and, and analytics with Spark, right? Literally tens of petabytes of data. And they also use the cloud for the, the flexibility you have in the cloud to actually do for peak demand. In the past, one of their problems was if you had sort of unexpected demand, they really had to, they went from three to four hours to actually, you know, six to 12 hours because they couldn't handle the peak, right? And cloud's really useful in that context. Another one, I, this is probably something you guys, you know, many, many in the room are running here. How many of you have a, sort of a meter on, you know, from your auto insurance guy? How many? Right. So what you can do, what you can do now is actually these, you know, progressive and any, any of these insurance guys will actually give you a device. You can actually stick it in your car, and that's actually doing real time. Um, it's actually collecting real time feedback on how fast you drive, how many times you sort of apply the emergency brake, and so on. And they use that now, um, and they. Pr Progressive has a product called Snapshot. They use that to actually give you customized quotes. So it's no longer, you're no longer 25-year-old driving a red car, right? You're actually somebody that they can actually build a model based on exactly how your driving habits are. And that, you know, may, you know, that obviously in a lot of cases, assuming you're a good driver, that really helps with your premium rates. Now, this is not, again, a lot of this is being done at Spark, um, at Progressive. And this is not just, um, you know, nice to have, you know, product, right? In the, in, your, in the 2014 earnings report, Progressive mentioned that they actually had um, you know, almost $2.5 billion in premium revenues off the Snapshot product. Right? That's the amount of claims and, and pre premiums are actually handing out based on you know, how many people are actually installing these devices in their car. Right? So just give you a perspective of you know, this stuff is real today, not just stuff we put in you know, slides. So as we go forward, Hopefully, this gives you a sense of how people have to put together all of these technologies, both on-prem and cloud. And what's been really interesting is, as you move, uh, as you have to take this data from both on-prem to cloud and cloud to on-prem, you want to have a sort of a. It's, it's been obvious to us for a while now, um, and this why we've been working on a product we call the shared services platform. So. Take a step back. At Hotmox, we obviously sell the hot HTTP cloud, HTTP uh, product, which is on-prem. But we also, on Amazon, have a product called HTC, the Hotmox Data Cloud. Similarly, on, Microsoft, on Azure, it's, uh, hard, it's, uh, it's HDI, right? Microsoft HDI. So the idea is that you have a common shared plane that you can actually pull, pull in all the security and the governance features in one point, both across your data, across your data center and, and, and the cloud, so you can actually make sure you use the same sort of open source technologies, whether it's Atlas or Ranger or any of these, you know, or even uh, the, the Spark Thrift server, the Spark JavaScript server, and on and on, right? You can use these commonly across both your uh, data center and, and um, you know, and on the cloud, right? So to, to, sh to show you what I mean, let's walk through some simple use case. I got a, a quick demo here. If you can move on to the demo, right? Um, in this demo, I'll walk you through how you set up a, a, a very easy use, use HTTP set, set up a simple cluster on uh, Spark cluster, with the, with including Zeppelin, which is the data science notebook, and actually give you, um, you know, key enterprise security features like uh, data masking, data, redact data redaction, um, filtering, and so on. Right? If you can go to the demo, please. All right, so let me start. So what you're seeing here is actually us actually deploying a data, data cloud. So that's the data cloud product. What we're first going to do is actually deploy the Spark cluster itself. Uh, get to the Zeppelin UI. As you can see here, this is actually running you know, Spark 2.1. Now, we'll actually load some data in the table using standard Spark. After that, we'll actually run a, a SQL query now. Now, what's interesting is this SQL query, um, we've got some interesting data masking policy. What it says is you might, you have all this data in, in the same table, but because you're an admin, we don't want to actually allow you to see the actual sales amounts in the table. Right? So it's not a view that we have defined. It's actually the same table, but you're, actually not, you're not able to see the actual, actual sales amounts that's happening in the, in, the, in the cluster. Similarly, we've also restricted 
you, you can't actually look at all the product keys. So if, if you can see here, the product key is less than 100. So you'll only see some rows. That's the row filtering aspect of it. So you run this. That's a range of mask. It's applied. And as you can see, the entire sales amounts are actually redacted out. So you don't, you don't have to do anything special. All you had to do was now run this as a different user. Now you're actually a, a real sales guy. Now you get access to all the sales amount and all the you know, pr product keys. Right? Now, this is something you're doing off data in S3, which is really uh, cool. Now let's quickly look at actually how we've defined this. As you can see, you run the sales amount, get the, get the answers back. Um, I'll show, give you a quick view of how the policies are defined. So that's the role level filter you set up. And say, for the admins, you, you have only the select access, but you know, role level filters where product key less than 100. Similarly, look at the masking aspect. Here, the masking option is actually we've completely redacted it out. You can do even more interesting things, like saying if you had like a zip code, you could say only show the last, you know, first two of the zip code or the last for the SSN and so on. Right. So, move on. The second part of the demo is the shared services cluster. Like I said, what this gives you is all the um, all of the range of policies and so on. So you can actually bring up any number of Spark clusters. You can so think of this as sort of a constellation. The shared service cluster holds access to all the data in S3, so all the compute clusters, all the Spark and Hive and so on that you bring up, we're actually going through, through here. So I go to the shared services. These are all the you know, services running in the shared service cluster. Um, what's interesting here is now you can actually see a demo of how um, Atlas gives you lineage. So for example, you want to track what's happening, who's accessing this data set, how is this data set created, and so on. So let's say you have a Hive table you created. Um, let's look at one of the interesting ones, because it's actually a pretty complex ETL flow. Um, what you'll see coming up here is the actual lineage for the entire ETL flow. So as you can see, it, this, this eventual sort of you know, Hive table was created by joining some MySQL databases, some Hive tables, some Scoop, and some Spark at the end. The last one is the Spark, Spark application, which brings all of them together. And we'll actually give you a view of the actual Spark application, which ran this. So if you want to do sort of more complex lineage, you'll actually be able to track. So that's a Spark application. So you can go to one place, see all of the security and, and policies, but also give you sort of the lineage and provenance for the data set itself. Right. Um, hopefully that gives you a view of sort of how we look at how you know, the entire community, um, also the same work we do with you know, Microsoft, and the same things will show up in the you know, HCI cluster versus the Amazon ones. Um, just give you a perspective of how, as people put together more complex applications, things like security and governance become really important, because you have to make sure the data doesn't get you know, wrongly accessed because it's in the cloud or vice versa. And having a product like, you know, having technologies like you know, Ranger and Atlas and so on gives you that sort of shared security policies to the HTC product. With that, thank you and appreciate the time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the snow. Uh, don't go skiing. All right. <laughs>